The cul-de-sac is a suburban trap. It's virtually useless as a road, doesn't support public transport, cycling or walking, and doesn't work well as a play or gathering place. Its literal translation from the French is bottom of a sack. So welcome to my new side quest series from City Skylines into Urban Planning. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into cul-de-sacs as well as hear from a variety of professionals on what they think about cul-de-sacs. Toward the end of the video, we are going to build cul-de-sacs in City Skylines 1 and 2. Let's deep dive into cul-de-sacs now. Within the USA, the cul-de-sac has the highest penetration in Plymouth, Minnesota, with 1.6 cul-de-sacs per road, followed by West Lake Stevens in Washington. According to E.R. Davis, who used GIS mapping software, he calculated that there are 582,679 cul-de-sacs within the USA. If you look at this map here, you can see a high concentration in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, and curiously, a lot in Alaska. Here's an interesting article from Gloucestershire in England, where developers want to develop 230 more homes on Europe's longest cul-de-sac named Foley Road. And as you can see what is circled here, this is the only entrance into the cul-de-sac. The article states that this type of branching cul-de-sac would put 400 cars on the road each day. After much heated public debate, a second access was added to the design, but for emergencies only. So despite its French name, the cul-de-sac as we know it today is not from Europe. Instead, it originated from the car-orientated suburban planning of 1950s America, a response to the perceived threat of the inner city. Cul-de-sacs, which were initially small offshoots from more traditional grid roads, eventually became isolated loops at the end of curvilinear patterns where only residents of the suburb would travel. They are the anaesthetists of connectivity and pose a danger to pedestrians, cyclists and motorists alike. Developers promoted cul-de-sacs as more efficient because they allowed higher densities, but in reality, cul-de-sac suburbs often ignore topography or nature in their development. They also require up to 50% less road, fewer pipes, streetlights and footpaths compared to traditional grid street patterns. However, this means fewer kilometres of footpaths, bike lanes and through streets for public transport. The cul-de-sac has been a developer's dream because it allows them to build more single-family homes on oddly shaped land or closer to natural features than would otherwise be possible with a grid. However, disconnected car-centric large homes resulted in higher per capita infrastructure costs, vehicle ownership and travel time costs, and higher overall purchase prices. Furthermore, cul-de-sac suburbs are often impractical for active modes of transportation such as walking, cycling and scootering, which is an advantage for suburban residents as they have higher rates of car ownership. In cul-de-sac suburbs, children might be only a few streets away from their friends, but in a tangle of winding roads and dead ends, it's virtually impossible to walk or cycle quickly to each other's houses. Even walking alone to school, a time-honoured rite of passage, is impractical in this type of development. Ultimately, cul-de-sac subdivisions are an urban planning dead end. While they may appear relaxing and pastoral, lurking around every curve is a hidden danger. Fatal car crashes are 270% more likely in cul-de-sac laden developments compared to older traditional neighbourhoods. It's time to rethink the cul-de-sac and consider alternatives that are safer and more practical for all modes of transportation. In winter countries with suburban cul-de-sacs, the inefficiency of the snowplow is another disadvantage of a discontinuous road. Just look at how long the snowplow takes to do the cul-de-sac. Let's now turn to three experts and ask them the question, are cul-de-sacs considered poor urban planning? Isaac Getz, a structural engineer, says urban planners have generally frowned upon cul-de-sacs as a poor urban planning strategy. While they remain popular in suburban planning, urban development is all about dense city living, and planning that promotes density is considered to be good urban planning. The thinking behind urban development is that a higher density of living and business promotes better living, better financial prosperity, and a better environment. However, the effectiveness of urban development in achieving these goals is debatable and not relevant to this discussion. He further says cul-de-sacs do not promote the same density as traditional grid planning as they create car-centric traffic flows that discourage walking. 
In a cul-de-sac neighborhood, you often have to take circulous routes to reach your destination. These longer travel paths discourage walking and force more people to use cars. The increased number of cars leads to more space being devoted to them, such as larger garages, parking lots, and wider streets, which reduces the density of the community. Cul-de-sacs also do not promote mass transit forms that are complementary to walking. It is difficult to design a bus system that weaves in and out of the various nooks and crannies of a cul-de-sac system, making such systems inefficient and underutilized. This further increases car dependency, which defines cul-de-sacs. Another downside of cul-de-sacs is that they lead to irregular shaped lots that are difficult to develop properly. This results in fewer homes and businesses per square acre, and this is a huge issue when building in city skylines 1 and 2 without using mods. Why must city skylines burden us with square zoning? We should have a line marker like the new district tool. Gates finishes off while saying, while urban planning is founded on the idea that city living and density are positive qualities, Urban planners are not solely focused on increasing density at all costs. However, it would be a mistake to call an individual who targets lower density as an urban planner, as they are planning things that are specifically not urban in nature. The next expert is Michael Lee, a public policy analyst. He says yes and no. The answer really depends on the planner's goals. He says cul-de-sacs pose an interesting challenge for urban planners. On the one hand, they offer the benefits of reduced traffic on residential streets, which is attractive to parents who value their children's safety. On the other hand, they can disrupt a street grid, which concentrates traffic on main roads, making them unsafe for pedestrians, cyclists, and other non-automotive users. While this isn't necessarily a problem, it can make it difficult to design mixed-use walkable areas, with urban planners placing heavy emphasis on walkability, downtown sectors, and reducing car use, it's becoming increasingly important to find ways to remake those areas with more mixed use and walkability in mind. He then talks about the town of Hanford in California. This provides a good example of the differences between a street grid that enables easy travel away from the main roads and one that is heavily focused on cul-de-sacs. The former offers many routes for traffic flow, while the latter limits the means to get from one end of the square mile to another. The heavily residential areas with cul-de-sacs have fewer commercial sectors, which are mainly located at the south corners. The concentration of traffic on main roads makes it difficult for pedestrians to navigate the area, which is not ideal for creating a walkable environment. His final thoughts are, although cul-de-sacs have their advantages and are popular with residents, urban planners are keen to promote walkability, downtown sectors, and reduce car use. It's important for planners to find ways to adapt the use of cul-de-sacs in modern urban planning, especially in residential areas where they can have the most impact on traffic flow and pedestrian safety. The next expert is Yusuf Shah, an urban planning consultant, and he talks about the effectiveness of cul-de-sacs in residential planning. As a professional planner, he can confirm that the answers provided so far by the other experts are mildly accurate. The use of cul-de-sacs in residential development can be a helpful tool depending on the goals of the particular planner or council. The most significant issue to consider is safety. By creating dead-end streets instead of continuous ones, neighborhoods and even blocks become the spatial domain of the residents. The winding paths and dead ends not only slow down traffic and keep people at low speeds, but also discourage petty criminals who would need an excellent knowledge of the street layout to escape the local law enforcement. It is also proven that discontinuous street systems have lower break-in rates than easily traveled streets. For example, the troubled Five Oaks district of Dayton, Ohio was restructured to create several small neighborhoods by converting many local streets to cul-de-sacs by means of barriers. Within a short time period, traffic declined 67% and traffic accidents fell 40%. Overall crime decreased 26% and violent crime fell by half. At the same time, home sales and values increased. Let's take the highest crime area in my city skylines to city of Thornton, this city block here, and put everything into cul-de-sacs. This will take a full redevelopment, but let's see if the crime drops over time. Let's now head into a book by Southworth and Iran Ben Joseph and their statement that car impermeable cul-de-sacs have economic advantages. 
Cul-de-sacs which allow a pathway for pedestrians and bicycles to flow through, but not cars, can be a good urban planning tool. They say making neighbourhoods more permeable to pedestrians and cyclists than to cars increases the odds of people choosing to walk or ride instead of drive, and increases the viability of community interconnectedness while preserving child play safe areas. He says that he can remember half a dozen pedestrian and cyclist permeable but car impermeable streets in Toronto, Singapore and Vancouver. He says he can think of pedestrian and cyclist cross paths in Aurora, Ontario, which is practically the definition of suburban as well. Cul-de-sacs being disconnected adapt better to topography since they carry no through traffic. They often have reduced standards for street widths, sidewalks and curbs. In Radburn, for example, the introduction of cul-de-sacs, reduced street area and the length of utilities such as water and sewer lines by 25% as compared to a typical grid street plan. He says some further advantages include that cul-de-sacs are highly coveted by home buyers who are willing to pay top dollar for the most secluded properties. For developers, this pattern is not only popular but also cost effective with infrastructure expenses much lower than the traditional interconnected grid pattern. Compared to the latter, cul-de-sacs require up to 50% less road construction, making them an attractive option for builders. Let's look at the crime now in Thornton, and it does appear that removing grid streets with thoroughfare access for criminals and replacing them with cul-de-sacs has decreased crime, just like the real-world data suggested. I must commend the game developers for this. Let's have a look at Hampstead Garden in England for what is considered a prized historical but yet creative cul-de-sac solution. Hampstead Garden features an extraordinarily suburban layout of two to three storey row houses or apartments bordering a central green space and connected by narrow service roads. This design ensures a peaceful pedestrian friendly environment that's removed from public streets. The cul-de-sacs also contribute to the residential neighbourhood's value, but unlike American post-war designs, Hampstead's cul-de-sacs are short, narrow and lack a circular turn at the end. Additionally, the architecture defines street spaces, while mid-block pedestrian walks connect cul-de-sacs and streets, creating an engaging path network for pedestrians. Roads are designed to discourage through traffic, with varying layouts and cross-section designs depending on their function. Sidewalks are always present, with trees, shrubs and architectural details such as walls, fences and gates, adding to the unique character of each street. The Hampstead Garden suburb has become a notable prototype for residential street design and road planning in both Britain and North America, although many of its original urban design qualities have been lost in its offspring. Today there is a surge of interest in traffic calming measures across the UK and the USA, and many communities are taking steps to make streets more pedestrian and cyclist friendly. Some traditional neighbourhoods, based on the grid pattern found in most older American towns and cities built before the 1920s, are being retrofit to achieve some of the values of the cul-de-sac. These neighbourhoods possess the connectedness, structure, walkability and accessible land use patterns that many planners seek today in new residential developments. They are, however, subject to invasion by the automobile and often suffer from the noise and hazards that come with excessive traffic on local residential streets. Berkeley, California is one community that has attempted to deal with the problem. Its grid system has been converted into cul-de-sacs and loops by placing bollards, large concrete planters, or planted islands as traffic barriers across some intersections. Pedestrians and cyclists can easily get around. Berkeley, California, although still, continue to enjoy the interconnected grid. Originally just an experiment, the scheme was strongly advocated by residents of some neighbourhoods, although disliked by others. Nevertheless, support was broad enough to make it a permanent program, Retrofitting an existing suburban cul-de-sac development to provide pedestrian connectedness will be more difficult. New pathways could be designed to interconnect cul-de-sacs, but in most cases they would have to be built on private rights of way along lot lines. To acquire such easements would be probably difficult since residents are unlikely to give up a portion of their land and privacy. So to create walkable suburbs, community and planners must be challenged. Traffic engineers and public officials should establish new frameworks to support the pedestrian and cyclists while confining the automobile. 
Rather than dismissing the cul-de-sac urban pattern, it is worth re-evaluating its values and possibilities in creative ways, as it has a long history of use in a variety of contexts that could offer safe and quiet streets as well as pedestrian and cycle access in a new spatial framework that avoids the problems of the open grid. If you enjoyed this side quest deep dive into cul-de-sacs, leave a comment on an urban planning niche area you would like researched and explored. Don't forget to keep up to date with the University City Planner Pro Masters modules, and if you haven't started, this is the first module. You'll never look at a city again once you do these modules. Thanks for watching.